River from Anaheim, California. USA, we have El Salvador, Colombia, Honduras, Puerto Rico, Argentina, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua. Thank you for the sign. Peru, a warm applause to all those watching. We're transmitting live here directly to the rest of the world. How beautiful. The whole world knows that these transmissions then become viral. So they're, thank you, thank you for all these flags. We were missing the Argentinian one. That's why there's less anointing today than other days. May God bless you. May he protect you. Now we greet those that are connected from Asia, Australia, Europe, Africa, those that are a part of this church. Many have joined us. There are thousands and thousands that never miss out. They feed themselves with this word week after week. And though they can't be participants of the of the worship and praise, we want that to always be an experience that you live in person. We don't want the screen to make it cold. We know it won't do justice. It won't do it justice. We know the screen is very cold and distancing, and when you see something, it's not the same emotion as living it. So we take care of that experience. We had the service on the screens in the plasmas out in the lobby, but we don't do that anymore. We do have it in the giant screen in the nursery, in the family theater, where the parents take their children if they get fussy, but we don't have it in, out there in the cafe, bookstore, or lobby because we want to take care of the experience. We don't want anyone to say, well, I'll listen to it on the outside while I go to the bathroom. Before we used to have TVs in the bathrooms too. People would worship from their comfortable seats. <laughs> Not anymore. We don't do it out of selfishness, but to take care of the experience and specifically to honor those that do the impossible to be here from early on. We honor the, all those that are here. Truly, thank you, thank you. However, the message is transmitted. The message is transmitted live. And though you have to live part of the experience here live, now we do have a connection with, with, the, with the world. And this has been going on for four years. Before I transmit what I believe God told me to tell you, here we have some river news. It's like a small, a small news video summarized in a minute, a minute and 30 seconds or so, something that happened that made us feel very special in Uganda and it had to do with our science class and our collaboration to that science class. Those children had never had a lesson like this. They've never learned about the human body or anatomy. A few things that are great details. This lasts about a minute and a half and a special greeting to all the children in Uganda that are watching us. It's all translated to English. They're watching the video in their English language so we send a special greeting to all of you and after we watch this video, I'll transmit what God told me to tell you. Thank you so much, River, because you supported us with different things whereby there was puzzles, scientific kits, human body, geometry book and sets, of which it has helped our school. Thank you, River Arena, for supporting our education by giving us cheer to the system. We really thank you so much, River Arena. We love you. It was so in interesting thing. Thank you, River Chat, for, for doing this. Thank you very, very much. Teamwork has been developed, which means in our community, we're going to learn to work as a team. This is a solar robot. We have opened it, and we are going to assemble it. He's using the direct power from the sun goes direct to the engine. Wow. 
This is a science class at River School. All the children are watching us. There are children, there are little kids, 270 something children that depend on us. There are children, we adopted them legally, we feed them. Now we feed them four times a day. Before it was three, now it's four times a day with breakfast, lunch, snack, and dinner. We feed them, we clothe them, we give them uniforms. And we're soon going to inaugurate the high school. Up until now, we've had an elementary school, but once we open up the high school, we'll be able to keep them for a little longer. Then all we'll need to do is marry them off. Then we can let go of them. <laughs> Are we ready to receive, yes or no? Very well. I grew up in a Christian evangelical church in a tradition that I'm profoundly thankful for. If not, I wouldn't be here. I grew up in the Christian tradition, but it's also worthwhile saying that in that tradition, we didn't really value intellectual life much. Any author or teaching that was outside of the Bible, which wasn't necessarily anti-biblical, it just, let's say it wasn't scriptural, it was seen as humanism or new era. When we didn't under understand something, we would say, oh, well, it's new era. We never understood what new era was, but when it sounded suspicious, we would say, it sounds like new era. There were women that would go get massages and, and they would have smooth jazz in the background and they would say, oh, that's new era, that's satanic. We would always say, it's from the devil if it's new era. Even when preachers would say audacious phrases, if you cited universal literature that wasn't from the Bible, we looked at it with suspicion. I remember a, a preacher that visited our local church. He mentioned Sigmund Freud in his message. He mentioned it just in passing. And as soon as the sermon ended, the local pastor asked them, why do you mention mundane people on my pulpit? Is the Bible not enough for you? Are the men and women that appear here in the Bible not enough for you? And the preacher answered, I just mentioned one of the dominant minds of the 20th century, a brilliant neurologist that won, won the Goeth Award. He was one of the brilliant German minds. And you're telling me that I have to discard him, that I can't even mention him, because you can't mention a single title of any of the books that Freud wrote? And then he said the magnificent epic phrase that became viral in those times. I'm sorry, Pastor, but being more intellectually capable doesn't make me less spiritual. <laughs> Just because I'm intellectual doesn't make me fleshly. So sometimes without wanting, we tend to make ignorance or the lack of preparation, we make disdain a virtue. We think that since God uses mules, we're all mules. We're like the donkey in, in, in Shrek. You say, well, God uses anything. Yeah, but that doesn't give us the license to make ignorance a virtue. I always tend to emphasize that neurogenesis, and I've spoken about this many times, it's a reoccurring theme. Neurogenesis never stops in the human brain. The human brain is the only organ that does not stop growing. The body stops growing at a certain point. Those that are short have probably lost hope if you're, if you're older than 30. You have different growth spurts in your adolescence, but at a certain point, everything stops growing. But the brain never stops working, growing. Ears as well. Male ears, they continue growing like cocker spaniels. My dad looked like Lassie. On top of it all, he was deaf, but my dad's ears were like this. And he would say, hey! One day when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask, God, why don't our ears stop growing? On top of our, our ears not stopping their growth, our brain never stops growing. In this world, there's nothing more mysterious than that half kilo of that gray matter housed in the human cranium. It's the masterpiece from God. That's the icing on the cake. In my country, they would say, it's the cherry on top. It's the icing. It's the most complex thing we have. In general terms, in simple terms, 
The brain consists of two hemispheres connected by 300 nervous fibers. Sorry, 300 million nervous fibers. Whoever has 300 has a serious issue. No, we all have 300 million fibrous nerves. And both hemispheres of the brain function with such high technology and science and that no human could ever invent. So the left hemisphere, it's all linear, it's logical. On that end, we have our mathematics, the exact sciences, and the right side of our brain is the intuitive and the creative part. Some have their creative side more developed. Generally speaking, designers, musicians, songwriters, narrators. Their right hemisphere is more developed. Those that are more logical, like accountants or those that work in exact sciences, they have their left hemisphere more developed. And God created us with the ability to continue learning until the day we die. Neurologists calculate that the capacity that human beings have of learning something new, it never stops. This is every second of every minute of every hour of every day of all of our lives. There's no moment in which we say, oh, at the age of 70, I can't learn anything new. Or at 80, my brain doesn't allow me. No, you can always learn. It's a muscle. Certainly you've heard the syndrome of unuse. It says that physical negligence destroys our health. Everything is a matter of using or losing. What you're not using, you're losing it. Receive that word, okay? If you're going through life and something falls, it's because you weren't using it. It's the basic principle of physiology. What you don't use, you lose. And just like muscles grow, through physical exercise, the mind grows with intellectual exercise. That's why they say that when you learn, you teach. Or sorry, when you teach, you learn. I was taught that by the founder of this church, Juan Carlos Ortiz. He would say, when I teach, I learn even more because I have to articulate in words and with my voice what I have in my head. In fact, it's a great way of studying because when you say, I can't retain it in my head, you should be saying it out loud. You should try explaining it to someone so that you can solidify the, the concept. So when you train your brain, it never stops its neurogenesis. And new connections are always being created, new flaming connections of things that maybe before we didn't think about or new ways of reasoning. There's a great phrase that says, when an idea, when something new expands a mind, that mind never goes back to its original size. It's not that the mind expands and then atrophies. No, whatever expands, expands. And if we stop using any part of our body, including our mind, then our mind begins to atrophy. And when the mind atrophies, in our case, our worship begins to become empty, gray, boring. Jesus told the Samaritan woman next to the well, she sa he said, you Samaritans know very little about the, p the one you worship. He didn't judge if they worshipped or not. He said, you don't know who you worship. So that worship is invalid because when we worship with ignorance, our, our worship is, is empty. So God doesn't just want us to worship him, but he wants us to know why we worship him. What he did for us, who God is. John 4.24 affirms, for God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So you can't just worship pretending or faking it, lifting up your hands, closing your eyes. We can all do that. We can all act. But worshiping in spirit and in truth, you have to know God to do that. But we always have the tendency of believing that the spiritual and the intellectual are mutually exclusive in this life. In other words, that the mind and our soul are enemies, but they're not enemies. There is no dichotomy. It's not that if you're intellectual, you're, you're, you stop being spiritual, or that if you're spiritual, then you're ignorant. Because a great love is always born out of a great knowledge. When you know someone, you fall in love more or less, or you realize that you're not in love. But when you get closer to someone that you love, someone that you think you're attracted to, then you fall in love more. If not, it's just a dazzle. 
In any other way, it's what we call wrongly love at first sight. No, that doesn't exist. It's just attraction. But then love grows as you get to know that person. So when you get to know God more and more, you fall more in love. The less you know him, the less of a relationship you have with him, it's tougher to love him because you don't know him. And sometimes you have misinformation of who God is. There was a text, a primary text in Israel that was repeated twice a day. It was called the Shema. And it said, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Heart, soul, and strength. That was the repetition that the Jewish people had. Love God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. That's the essence of the Torah. Tie it around your neck, put it above your door frames, paint it at all the entrances, repeat it in the morning, the first thing you say, and the last thing that you repeat at night before you go to sleep. Proclaim it, teach it to your children and your grandchildren. But one day somebody asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus cited the Shema that all devout Israelite knew. Loving God with your, your heart, your soul, your strength. But one detail escapes us, that Jesus made an amendment. An amendment is an addition to the law. The Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, we know about that in this country. An amendment is something that is added. So Jesus adds an amendment. He said, love God with all your heart, all your strength, all your soul, and all your mind, up until then nobody had included the mind. Jesus added that word, mind. He elevated God's love from the third power to the fourth power. He said, don't leave the mind out of it. And most believers, we believe or have believed, that there's always conflict between science and faith. But sometimes, the only thing we say to certain intellectual people is, you receive it by faith, believe it and don't question it. No, but I want to understand. No, you don't understand anything. Receive it, receive it now, receive! And that's it. Let them receive it by force, like a suppository. Wherever we can squeeze it in, but it has to go in. And the intellectual says, I want to understand, is that wrong? Yes, it's wrong, you have to understand it by faith. No, that's what we say, but despite the fact that we say these things, we would never go back to a doctor's office that looks at our report and says, well, it seems like God allowed your lungs to develop a strange marking. So what I'm going to prescribe is that you go home and pray, come back two weeks later, we'll do another diagnosis to see if God changed something. And you'll, you would say, I'll never go back. Why? Is it because we stop believing in God? No, we still believe in God, but we want a doctor that can understand the natural world of cause and effect. Why would we go to the doctor if he was just going to tell us to pray? We want a doctor that has knowledge, correct, on how the body works, and we want, us, we want him to tell us with fundamental logic what caused that marking or that blemish to, to appear. And above all, we want a doctor that knows a way to eliminate that blemish. We don't want him to tell us, oh, we'll be praying. We don't even want a mechanic to open up the hood and say, mm, well, leave it here. I'll pray for it for about a week, and then you come and look for it in a week. No, we don't want that. If not, well, if we, don't, if we wouldn't tolerate that with a mechanic or a doctor's office, why would we want people to leave their brains in the baptismal waters? Why do we want people to stop questioning or trying to understand? Why are we bothered when a family member or an unbeliever, somebody that doesn't have, that hasn't walked in our Christian pilgrimage, we get upset when they want to reason and we tell them they have to accept by faith. And they say, whether you believe it or not, it works. Yeah, it's right. That's true. There are things that work by faith, but the Lord didn't leave our mind out of it. There aren't conflicts or contradictions between faith and science, but sometimes I insist unchristians have a certain fear that if somebody studies too much, we're going to lose them, that they're going to stop believing in God. Humanism is going to take over their minds as if food had more power than salt. We're scared that if our child wants to study psychology, we say, no, they might go crazy and they'll start praying to Freud. No, that won't happen. Why won't it happen? Whatever we study. Well, if I 
disassemble my computer and I ask a, a computer expert to teach me in detail how that computer works, I'm not going to reach the conclusion that a manufacturer doesn't exist, that the computer made itself. No, now that I've investigated that the com how the computer is made, I know that it was formed by the Big Bang and, and by the ocean. No, I'm going to understand that somebody made it. Science always points to God. It's impossible to study the human body and not conclude that God made it. It's impossible to study the ocean and not conclude that God created it. Do we agree, yes or no? That's why I, I always say, the more we know, the more reasons we'll have to worship. The more we discover and the deeper we get into things, we know more. And the more you know, the more you enjoy. I once said it. Someone that studies textures of, of wine and that can drink a glass of wine and say, hmm, I think they used the wrong wood. But the undertones are spectacular because you can combine it with meat. However, there are some fruits that you can taste after about a minute. These are the people that know the secrets of, of wine. Then there's the drunk that steps on a cork and then starts to speak stupidities. What did you drink? Oh, I don't know. Something there. It was black. They have no idea what it was. Knowing allows you to enjoy more. A musician says, wow, those notes that they play, how incredible. Those that don't know music say, oh, it's such a nice melody, but they don't understand anything. Knowing allows you to enjoy more. These are learned or acquired tastes. They say there are, are certain acquired tastes. You don't necessarily have the palate to understand it. You have to learn it. So when you learn it, you begin to understand why this food is so expensive, why this menu is so expensive, because it's an acquired taste. Well, worshiping God, sometimes there's also an acquired taste. Sometimes at the beginning we're shocked because he saved us from hell, because he brought us salvation and healing to our family. But then the deeper you get into God, you start to fall in love more with him because you get to know him more. You can't be spiritual without being intellectual. At the same time, your, your mind expands, your faith also expands. It's never the opposite. The more we know about God, the more of a desire we'll have to worship Him. The more we get to know about the universe and how the seasons of the world work, the sun, the stars, the snow, we have more reasons to worship. Do you believe it, yes or no? With that being said, I want to clarify what it means to expand our mind. I said today that when an idea expands a mind, that mind never goes back to its original size. Well, what does it mean when we say expand your mind? Well, there's a word that we use very often, and it's the word education. And I once told you that it is derived from two Latin roots. Together they mean to bring out. Education is bringing out what's inside. There's another translation that says, awakening curiosity. That should be education in any civilized country. Awakening the curiosity within our children or whoever the students are. But if we analyze the methodologies of our schools, anyone might think that education is squeezing in, forcing in. This person's going to understand because they're going to understand. That's not awakening their curiosity. Not too long ago, sociologists have discovered that if your child, if in a grading scale from 1 to 10, like it was used in my time, if they have a 5 in mathematics, but they can always organically get a 10 in language arts, then they immediately need a tutor for for language arts, not for mathematics. I'll say it again in case you thought I said it wrong. I didn't say it wrong. If the child gets a 2 or 3 or 4 out of 10 in math and in all the other all the other subjects, but in language arts they get a 10, you have to identify where they flow organically and that's what you have to train them in. This child has an inclination in language arts. Why are we going to force math into them? No, after all, they may become a mediocre math through force, but that didn't happen before. How were we identified with in what we wanted to do? 
When we, if we would say, I want to be an architect, they would say, no, you're grandma. You're going to do something that gets you a job. So we have to learn to identify everyone's DNA, what their inclination is. A creative needs a creative tutor not to learn something by force. But we tend to think, since they're doing poor in math, let's get them a math tutor. Well, in general terms, it's good if, if it helps them not flunk or fail their class. But that's not the solution to the problem. Academic programs revolve around forcing in knowledge, and their, their, their goal is not to awaken curiosity or to, to discover what travels in your genes or your DNA. Certain things are inherited. Others are brought on by the environment around us. But our, edu our education systems see education as transference of knowledge. And teachers only evaluate students by one thing, which is what? Can you repeat like a parrot what I just said? And that's how we study our, our alphabet prepositions through, through, because, by, for, after, this, that, and the other. I didn't know what it all meant, but I repeated it. So the number one question in any classroom is, Professor, what you're about to teach, is this going to come out on the test? And the answer is what? No, I'm not going to test on it. Ah, then why are we learning it if he's not even going to test us on it? I once told you that in elementary school, sorry for being so repetitive with these things, but they exemplify what I'm, what I'm trying to say. In elementary school, the first thing they taught us how to teach to draw was a home. I drew a home. I drew my home. My home was just a square home. I drew my home with two windows and the gate that it had. And my teacher said, no, my friend, that's not a, that's not a house. And I said, what, do I live in a cave then? Is that, how is that not a house? I see some drew their homes wrong. I'm going to draw an actual home. Always a roof like this with two peaks. There was no roof with two peaks in, my, in, in Argentina in my time. A chimney, a walkway, red tiles, a tree by the door. That's when I realized I had never lived in a home. I lived in a shoebox, if anything. <laughs> and so what's the point? They teach us how to think. They teach us how we should draw the home that we've never lived in. And we lose the most important thing, which is the love of learning, the love of no knowing more. And the same thing can, ha can happen in the church. You have to believe this, repeat it by faith. There's a, there's a, there's a trend. All right, look for three people, say this. Tell them to repeat this. Do you believe this? You have to believe it. Believe it without even seeing it. Repeat to the person behind you. When I'm in a crowd like that, I feel like I'm being insulted. At a certain point, I turn to the person next to me and say, I'm not saying anything more. All right, turn to the person next to you and say, you look nice today. Turn to the person with the mustache next to you and say, you look handsome. Hey, what's going on? I don't like any of that. I don't like to be invaded that way, and I don't think you like it either. I don't know who told what preacher that if they have us repeat things, then we'll, we'll learn it. No, that's like school. We forgot most of what we were told to repeat because it's not about accumulating borrowed ideologies or repeating like a parrot what the teacher said or what the apostle said or what the pastor said. Obviously, we're adults now. Nobody's going to teach us how to draw a house, but they tell us how God thinks, what pleases him, what doesn't please him, how to speak to him. How can you miss out on the services during the week? That's why you don't please God because he's going to take away your blessing. How to make sure God doesn't send you to hell. They tell you that God's going to send you, that he's not. Now he will, now he won't. He forgave you because they're the, they're the ambassadors of hell. They decide who goes and who doesn't. And certain leaders say that they love the truth, but loving the truth means, to them it means not reading anything secular, not watching the news, don't contaminate yourself with bad news. And I always say news isn't the plane that arrives, it's the plane that falls. That's news. Imagine you turn on the news station and they say, today, 300 airplanes landed successfully. Lupita from Washington, D.C. No, the news is, it, did a plane fall? No, okay, then there's no news about plane. Unfortunately, that's news. They used to say, no, don't contaminate yourself with bad news. 
I understand that everything that's an exaggeration is, is bad, but you can't ignore what's happening because that's when you become ignorant and just wise in your own opinion. They've tried to exterminate me many times because I've mentioned Pablo Neruda or Juan Manuel Marquez. They say, how can you mention Mario Benedetti? He was a socialist. Or how can you listen to singers that are not Christian? Ignoring great poets or songwriters. It's not that I mentioned Bad Bunny. No, it's not that. No, I'm talking about poets. How can you mention worldly people? Well, it's as if the biblical writers were immaculate. And this has been happening for centuries. Tertulliano was the father of Latin literature. And he asked, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? Trying to say that the intellect of Greece should never be mixed with the spirituality in Jerusalem. And that was represented by Plato, Aristotle, and and Plato. But others reasoned that if God was able to speak through the donkey in Balaam, then there was no limit for God. Wisdom could flow from anywhere to anyone. And so they didn't just read the Bible, but they also read Greek scripts, Roman scripts. And they would look for wisdom wherever they could find it because they said, all truth is God's truth. Loving God with all your mind means recovering common sense and losing the fear of expanding your mind. You can feel that God speaks to you. They're going to exterminate me. But sometimes God can speak to you through a movie. I'm not, I've never said, let me watch a movie so God can speak to me. No, sometimes I just try to distract myself, but there's a phrase or there's something that impacts me, and since I'm connected to the Holy Spirit, He's always transmitting. It's like radio waves. Right now we're not listening to them because we're not connected to those waves with the device. But if we were to connect to that frequency, the radio is always transmitting. Internet is always transmitting. Generating information. When you connect, it's not that as soon as you find internet you connect. No, we connect. And if you're connected all day, God can speak to you through any song, through anything. It's not that God is stereotyped to speaking through the pastor or through a new song or through a worship song. Yes, God does speak through all those things, but he doesn't just speak through those things. Who can limit God? God speaks through whoever he wants, even through an unbeliever. God can give you a message through them. He can teach you a lesson that the unbeliever doesn't even know they're preaching to you, but they say something to you that you say, whoa, and it's the Holy Spirit using them. Really? Whoa, he used the mule, didn't he? So God, loving God with all your whole mind doesn't mean that we should get nervous in respects to where will this book lead me to. If I'm sincerely seeking the truth, but sometimes we're afraid of knowing more because it'll go against our faith. But no, it's the opposite. I once had to read Compared Religions because I was an illustrator in that book and I realized how a Catholic thinks, what they believe. What does an Adventist believe? What does a Jehovah's Witness believe? When you don't know these things, the first thing you do is you rebuke them. You are brainwashed, the spirit of the great prostitute. No, these, these are people that have their own beliefs. So instead of debating like a fan and sending them to hell, you can even debate with knowledge. When you know what other religions believe in, what other beliefs are rooted in. For example, there was a, a president in Argentina years and years ago, the first president of democracy in Argentina. His name was Raul Alfonsi, and he has a phrase that's still viral on social media, and he says, you can debate with any person from the left or right, politically speaking, and it's always going to be a rational discussion. But it's impossible to debate with the fan because they're going to reply with voluntarism, with ready-made phrases, with slogans, with demagogues, and the conversation will become rampant, and it's not something that the people, the country, deserves. A fan says, no, I don't know, I rebuke you, you devil, I rebuke you. That's all they say. Because the Lord gave us a victory, the Lord gave us a victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. And they can't even debate. 
All they have are the phrases that their pastor made them repeat 42 times, but they can't debate. So when we don't have arguments, all we can do is rebuke demons. Those that think differently are heretics, and we send them to hell, and that's the end of our problem, and that's how it works. And that's because they've told us, don't think, don't question. Leave your brain in the baptismal pool, because once you get to the church, you don't need your brain anymore. The pastor will think for you. The leader will make all your decisions. They'll tell you who you should marry. They'll tell you where you should go, if you can go on vacation, how much you should tithe, you should report to who. And so you leave your brain floating in the little pool where you were baptized. That's where your brain remains. The usher comes. They collect all the ba all the brains in a black trash bag. How many were baptized today? Hold on. Um, about 20, Pastor. They count the brains left in the pool. Once we understand what it means to expand our mind, we have to understand what it means to rethink. You say, God doesn't change. You're right, God doesn't change. God is the same one yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. God doesn't change. His faithfulness does not change. God isn't older. God isn't more senile. God isn't uh, a misunderstood grandpa now because he's old. No, God doesn't change. We change. Tell the person, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're the ones that change. And we need a re-engineering of rethinking what we think. If not, you can't expand your, your mind. I'm always rethinking everything all the time. I don't want to become a closed person. This is my way because this is how I learned it. No, there are things that will come through age. Nobody can make me listen to, to hip-hop, not even by court order. That has to do with my age, but they're my preferences that have changed through the years but I never want to feel that I have everything resolved why because God didn't create us with the capacity to just think but he also created us with the capacity to rethink look every day our world is changing everything changes from the number of hairs on your head, which aren't the same as yesterday, to our affectionate relationships. Our friendships change. We change. Everything mutates. We find a friend from childhood and they say, hey, you've changed so much. You're not the same guy. Oh, of course. It'd be a problem for us to be the same people. Life changes us. Battles change us. Traveling changes us. Getting to know other cultures changes us. For good or for bad, but we change. How many times in counseling do you hear family members telling their husband or wife, saying, you changed, you changed. Pastor, you told them that they're not the same person I married. Well, well, no, of course not. Countries change. Governments change. If that all changes, how can you expect your husband or wife to not change? Soccer players change. They're old once they hit 35, and then they need a new player. And the same way we learn to educate a child, we have to learn to discipline them. Once we believe we're experts in disciplining children, then we find adolescents in our home. They suddenly appear night to day. On, Thursday, on Friday, we put a child to bed, and then Saturday morning, a mammoth wakes up just in one night. It's like a, a, a worm turning into a butterfly or a butterfly into a worm. I don't know. But we never stop changing. If the last time you saw a hot air balloon was on your teacher's map, then you might realize that times have changed. If the last time you saw a globe was in your, in your elementary school, then many countries have disappeared and new countries have appeared. What we used to know about the universe 10 years ago is now obsolete because we have more knowledge. Knowledge becomes old as soon as it's written because new discoveries are being made through satellites. What's worse is sometimes a spouse promises eternal love. They swear love to their partner, but that doesn't guarantee that that'll last forever. You can't legalize swearing love forever because feelings and emotions and people change. And you have to refinance that relationship. 
Our own bodies change. We have a layer of external skill that renews each day, every seven days. There's dead skin cell scales, dead skin cells that fall off every seven days. It's not like a, you don't shed like a lizard. No, it's something that happens without you realizing. Each cell in our body renews itself every seven years. And as we change, our brains operate more through memory than with creativity. And many of us want God to give us new things, but we don't allow him to take away the old. And part of leaving the old, it's not the same thing as leaving the old guy. It's something that is known as our filter. I love this because it opens up our mind in respect to what Paul said. And here's what I'm going to tell you now. Psychologists say that all human beings have a filter to see things through, to see people, to see the world. It's called cognitive bias. In simple terms, it's the way in which we process everything we see and hear. We all have a cerebral lens. So each person has a subjective reality. Nothing's objective. Nobody sees reality objectively. Everyone sees it according to the, the way they were brought up, the way they're predisposed to seeing things. For example, maybe we have a manager that makes the same comments in the same way to two different employees. He calls both employees and he reprimands them both. One receives it as a just criticism, constructive criticism, and they reason, well, good thing, because they help me realize that I'm doing a bad job. I didn't like what they said, but I appreciate the criticism because now I know how I can improve. The other person is offended to the death. But who do they think they are to speak to me that way? This person might be paying my, my, my salary, but I'm not their slave. What's the difference? Well, the cognitive bias from each employee because they were told the same thing. Maybe the second person that was offended to the death, they might have had a, par a parent that mistreated them, and now they see any authoritative figure as an abuser. Here's another example. Two people in the same church service today, right now, this morning. One came here and said, oh, surely they're going to brainwash me and they're going to try and get money out of me, surely. I know them, I know them. They're trying to get money out of me. Another one says, I need a word that will recharge my batteries for the rest of the week. The same message arrives, the same service. The first person goes home thinking, ha ha, they tried brainwashing me, but they couldn't. They can't even steal a dollar off me. They they leave, the, they walk out the door looking at the urn saying, ha ha, I escaped you. But the second person says, that's the word I needed today. Two different people, two different perceptions. We're always going to find what we're looking for. Always. If I say, oh, there comes the gossiper, then I'm going to see her as a gossiper. You find what you look for. Why? Because the filter seeks that we reaffirm what we already believe. That's a subjective reality. I'm looking for something that can reaffirm what I already believe. That's why legalists gather with legalists, condemners with condemners, Free thinkers with free thinkers because they seek out people that think the same. They can't tolerate someone that thinks differently. They look for people that share the same filter. What differs are not the acts, but the filters. That cognitive bias affects our relationship with God, in fact. Because generally speaking, our relationship with God has to do with the relationship that we had with our parents here on earth. Worse, if we didn't have any parents on earth or if they were absent, if we had an absent father or an abusive father, then it's likely that we will see God as an abusive God that's distant or uninterested in us. It's the same God but a different filter. You feel that God is always punishing you, and another one, another person might think that God is always blessing them. That's why it's important to focus on how we think, how we filter things. Because our interior mentality designs all of our exterior world. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The way we see the world, the way we are is how we see the world. It's like a grandpa that I once mentioned that as the grandpa's taking a nap his grandson puts cheese cottage cheese on his mustache he wakes up and says this 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 bedroom smells like cheese it stinks he goes out to the living room and says this whole home stinks 
Then he goes outside and says his whole world stinks, but it's his mustache. And us Christians tend to share one common filter, and it's called tradition. I wasn't taught that way, but reason, because it's wrong. No, 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 I wasn't taught that way. Well, then what's wrong with it? No, I just, I wasn't taught that way. Where I come from, it's done this way. Well, that's a tradition. Period. And sometimes as it happens with the hard drive, when it gets a virus, our mind has archives that are infected because of the way our parents thought, maybe the way our pastor thought, it's infecting us. His insecurities, who we admire, who we love, maybe we have a person that influenced us, those biases come into us. Maybe you were brought up in a church that condemned everyone, and so now you go and condemn people. And if anyone says anything different, then you send that person to hell. People think that the world thinks, but really it's just their mustache. And if you can't uninstall those traditions, then they're going to undermine everything that we do. Everything. God wants to prosper you, but you can't prosper because we have that cognitive bias that you have to save up for when times will be scarce. We all come from poverty. But one thing is to be poor. Another thing is to have the mentality of being poor for the rest of your life. How many miserable and poor people have fortunes in the bank? Living miserly isn't reciprocate of not having enough, enough money in the, in, the, in the bank. How many people feel that they don't have enough, but they have more than what they'll ever be able to spend in their lives, but they have a cognitive bias of a fear that they will one day live through scarcity. So half of learning has to do with learning, of course, but the other half has to do with unlearning. And just so you know, unlearning is twice as hard as learning. I would never trade a, a crowd of atheists for a crowd of theologians or a, a, a crowd of Christians, of pastors, because atheists say, all right, surprise me. But those that think they already know, those that were illiterate in the 21st, th those that are illiterate in the 21st century aren't those that can't read or write, but those that can't learn or unlearn. Some of us might have had parents or grandparents that say, no, 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 I, I don't understand this remote control. Turn on the TV, please, turn it on for me, I don't get it. But mom, let me explain it. No, I don't understand too many buttons, it, it makes me nervous. She's a technological illiterate person. No, 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 my phone doesn't work, my phone doesn't work. Oh, well, you haven't charged it. Oh, so I have to, and now I have to tend to it? Yes, of course. She doesn't forget to feed the dog, but she forgets to charge her phone. Once we learn one thing, it's nearly impossible to, un to, unlearn, some, to unlearn that same thing. It's terribly difficult because that same mental structure that makes us teachable gives us the same potential to make us unteachable. It's more difficult to remove old thoughts from your mind than to install new thoughts. That's the great mental captivity. That's the challenge that Jesus faced. If you analyze Jesus' teachings, he was a, pe a professor, a teacher of unlearning. 80% of his messages were, you heard it be said, but I say to you, he was uninstalling old concepts and giving new truths. You've heard it be said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What would the people say? Amen, amen. That's why I, I knocked this lady's tooth out because she did the same to me. Who's not going to approve something that they know? But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. And after that, there were no amens. If you are sued in court, and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat to. We've all heard sermons like, hate the, the Asian person that cuts you off on the highway. Hate the Hispanic in the, that's the immigration officer. Amen, amen. Yeah, let's say, let's say, let's say. No, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for your mother-in-law. Who's going to say amen to that? So half of spiritual growth consists of learning what we don't know 
The other half consists of unlearning what we believe we know. That's the hardest part. Arrogance makes your mind rigid. There's nothing worse than speaking with an arrogant person because they believe what they know. They know what they believe. And there's no way to, for you to get to them. But humility allows your mind to remain open and to remain teachable. How can I know it all? Maybe there are things I don't know. Maybe I'm doing things wrong. Maybe I learned that wrong. Paul writes in Romans 12.2, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. That's renovation of the mind. He doesn't say keep your mind intact. No, he says renew it. The apostle says, Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. God's perfect, pleasing, and good will. You get that by renewing your mind. What does it mean to not copy the behaviors of the world? Well, really it's confronting our minds. There's a pattern of thinking, uh, a filter of tradition that forms inside of us. And Paul tells us that when our mind, when it's renewed, then and only then can we get to know God's will. If not, we won't know it. We'll think that God's will is condemning people. Because people that attack, people that denigrate, people that gossip, they think they're doing it for God. Like back in the times of the Crusades when they would go out and kill Christians, they did it thinking they were doing it for God. The, the KKK um, eliminated colored people thinking that it was divine justice. And so people that think they're doing things for God, it's because they don't really know how God thinks. Because they never renewed their minds, so they can't really know what God's perfect, good, and pleasing will is. So here's the central point. Why don't we say what we don't know with the same ease that we use when we explain things we know. Why do us pastors believe that we should always have the right answer to everything that happens? I think that when we say we have all the answers, the only thing we're making clear is our insecurities. Because an arrogant and insecure person believes they know it all. Those that are secure in themselves, they don't lose any manhood or femininity, according to the case, by saying, I don't know. Really, I'll be honest, I don't know about that. But we have such a fear of losing our little corner of the truth that we cling on to our doctrine, we defend it, and we attack those that think differently. I always ask myself, what would happen if we had the intellectual bravery and courage and spiritual courage of admitting our ignorance in many things? I think a humble confession of, yeah, I don't know it all, it guarantees more conversions than our closed minds. Yes or no? Don't we admire people that say, you know what, I really don't know about this. I don't know too much about this. Sometimes people say, I don't hear you talk about revelations. Well, I don't know too much about the fourth beast and the, the seventh horn and the third mother-in-law. I don't know too much about that. Maybe that'll get me into problems, but that ignorance, we're, we're all ignorant in something. Or does everybody here know about architecture or astronomy? Or is everyone here a physician? No, we're all ignorant in many disciplines, right? Well, sorry. All the Harvard alumni came today. But in the next service, we'll have all the ignorant people. Maybe I'll hear more amens. We have to admit that we don't have all the answers. We don't know why pious people also died from COVID. Why are there children that have leukemia? But we do know the one that has all the answers and knows all the answers, and he knows why, even if we don't know why. Yes or no? That's what we have to do. Say, I don't know. Talk to God. If he doesn't explain it here, he'll explain it in heaven. But for years, we've tried to offer what we never should have offered. And for a long time, we, o we offered all the answers. Come because Christ will heal you. But we should be saying, he may heal you or he may not heal you. Come because Christ will prosper you. He will prosper you, free you, and liberate you. We had a sign like that at home. My dad gave his life to, to the Lord in 1975, and he allowed the church to hang 
uh, a sign on top of the garage saying, Christ heals, redeems, and frees every day except for Tuesday because we didn't have services on Tuesday. And so if something bad happened on Tuesday, you were, you were done for because Christ wasn't available. What does it mean to, to believe you have all the answers? Oh, well, if you're sick, it's because you must have done something wrong. You have a hidden sin. That's why the illness came along. If you were not healed, it's because you lacked faith. You're suffering. You're already suffering, and now they're putting that burden on you, that you lack faith. If you're not doing well, it's because you stopped congregating and you left that apostolic coverage. If you don't prosper, it's because there's a curse upon you. And then an Asian eats a bat before they digest it. The whole world starts trembling in fear with a virus that propagates, and those that believed had all their all the answers had to lock themselves in their kitchens because this was too contagious. I'm not judging. Sanitary measures are prudence. That's good. Nobody asked them to go out and heal people. But the disappointing part was when people realized that us pastors didn't have all the answers. That now we also had many questions and we were also fearful. Why did God allow the pandemic? Well, why does he allow wars? I don't know. I have no idea. No clue. God didn't send us to have all the answers. He wants us to offer a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. That is our task. Yes or no? Somebody needs to say amen. Amen. Yes or no? Now you say amen. And that relationship is the answer to all the questions. So we guide people to a relationship with God, and then he gives us the answer. And I'm going to say this. Let me add this. It's not wrong to, be, to have doubts. In fact, if our children, if your children go through a period when they start to doubt God, or maybe they question your faith or faith in general, it's not necessarily about, 99% of the time, it's not about a demon. You don't have to pray for them at night. You don't have to anoint them while they sleep. You don't have to grab those canoes that they use as shoes and anoint their shoes. No. The best thing is to say, son, daughter, I understand you're doubting, but soon you'll have your own encounter with God. That'll give you credibility. And your child will believe and understand that you're a rational child or a rational person. I'm talking about an adolescent at the age of 15, 16, 17, when they start questioning. You tell them, look, I'm not asking you to leave your brain in the baptismal pool because I didn't do it either. I was brought up in a Christian household. That when I was seven, they gave their lives to Christ. So I spent most of my childhood in a Christian household. But being born in a garage doesn't make me a car. I can be born in a fishbowl and I won't be Nemo, right? So I had to face my own doubts. Doubts are something guaranteed in Christian homes. Doubts aren't resolved by sending that child to Sunday school so the teacher can answer their questions. No, that's not how it's done. Basic things in faith are sometimes so incorporated that we take them for granted. And we have to examine them before we make them our own, before we inherit our parents' faith. In any other way, the children of Christian parents have prefabricated beliefs that come from their parents, and that's not a living faith. That's not something that breathes. It's empty. The worst thing that our children question their faith isn't the worst thing. If your child says, oh, it's, it's tough for me to go to church or I don't like going to worship, that's, that's fine, that's healthy because that's making sure that they want to inherit their parents' faith. They won't be God's grandchildren. God doesn't have grandchildren. He has children. It's not that, oh, since I'm a believer, then, then he's a grandchild. No, they have to have their own encounter with God. It's fine for them to resolve their own and their own questions. You give them a Christian household, a Christian environment, they have to see that at home we worship Christ and we talk about God. It's possible we, hold, we have family devotionals. However, they're still going to have to have their own encounter with Christ. For them to go through a period of, 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 of rebelling is not wrong. We've all had a period of, of rebelling, right? Try to remember. Don't say, oh, not me. All right, then you have Alzheimer's. But we've all been through rebellion. You know what the problem is with our children, especially here in the U.S.? It's relativism. 
Él me da lo mismo. It's, eh, it's all the same. Oh, son, what do you believe about Jesus? Oh, I don't have any problems with him. In fact, I'm wearing a cross right now. And who is Jesus? Uh, well, you know what? I love him, and I love John Lennon and Bono from you too. I love Jesus and Taylor Swift. That's the problem. Having the syndrome of Pontius Pilate. Pilate was about to set Jesus free because he saw Jesus as a good guy. He didn't even believe in Jesus, nor did he hate Jesus. Jesus or Pilate saw him as a good guy. He said, he was basically saying, give me a reason to set you free, man. He would ask the Jews, what did this man do to you? He considers himself to be the king of the Jews. Oh, come on. No, really. What did he actually do? Pilate's woman said, don't get involved with this just man. That's what he heard from his wife. He just wanted to set this man free, but by not choosing, he chose. He was a relativist. He didn't care whether he let him go or put him on the cross. And from there, the, the famous phrase of he washed his hands because he literally washed his hands. That's the symbol of eh, you want to kill him, kill him. In, all the, uh, in the end, he's your victim. That relativism is the problem in the U.S. You get any American and they'll say, oh, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in God. When was the last time you went to church? Oh, I don't remember, but I believe in God. And also Superman. They have no clue. That's the problem. <laughs> and our children can get infected by that. Be very close to the cross, but far from Christ. That's why I insist it's good that at a certain point in their lives, our children begin to doubt their faith. Because that path, I guarantee you, it will always take them to an encounter with God. We have to give thanks for the Saul of Tarsus because sooner or later they fall from their horse, receive a revelation, and they become warriors for God. Does someone believe it, yes or no? In fact, even Jesus' followers had difficulties believing. They had seen miracles. They had seen him walk on the water. They had seen him raise the dead. Thomas, one of Jesus' followers that didn't believe that Jesus had risen. James, Jesus' half-brother, also didn't believe for some time. Why? Because we're the only creatures that need to understand. We reason. Dogs don't reason. Cats don't reason. They react by instinct. Even if you say, oh, no, my cat is so loving. No. They react. The cat doesn't get up and say, oh, today I feel like a dog. <laughs> or the dog doesn't say, oh, today I perceive myself as a, uh, a they, them dog. No, they just react. We're the ones that reason. So if you're reasoning and sometimes you're doubting, well, you're in good company. Where is the child that got lost within you? Why did God want to fill a crib to then allow it to be emptied? What's the meaning of my life? What would have happened if I took a different path? Sometimes we suffer that spiritual vertigo that we call doubt, and we think that on top of whatever is happening, God must hate us because we're doubting. And sometimes, all the structure that we put our lives over, whether it be a marriage, a home, our children, a career, sometimes it just falls apart. And every belief that we had is threatened by a diagnosis of cancer. And we say, why, Lord, why? And inevitably, what happens? We doubt. Doubt isn't the opposite of faith. It's the opportunity to have faith. The enemy of faith is not doubt. It's relativism saying, I don't care. Saying, I don't care if I go to church today or just watching the Super Bowl instead. I don't care if I just have a barbecue with my friends instead of going to have Holy Communion. That's the problem. That's the hardest crowd to preach to. It's denying yourself to believe, to thinking, leaving your brain in the baptismal pool. Now, I bless those that doubt. I like when I speak to many artists, many politicians, they sit down at a table with me and they say, look, explain to me, if God is love, then why did that certain thing happen in Ukraine? I love that person because you can debate with them because they want to know because they have valid doubts and I have valid answers. 
And if I don't have answers, I say, oh, I have no clue. I don't know. It makes me credible. What do you mean you have no clue? Well, I'm not God. I serve God. I know who has the answers. It's just that I don't. Doubt is a necessary aspect in this journey we call life. And we read in the Bible and we find people that doubted. And many curves of the, of the path. David, Job, Solomon, Jeremiah. In fact, Jesus' own cousin, John the Baptist. His cousin. The one that baptized Jesus himself. The one that saw the dove descend from heaven and he heard God say, This is my beloved son. He doubted his cousin. Because it's one thing that when you're there, but when he was under arrest, he had people go ask Jesus, Hey, can I die in peace? Are you the one that is to come or should we wait for another one? And Paul says that John was the greatest man born by a woman. Some time had passed since he baptized Jesus, but now in the darkness of the cells, of the jail cell, doubt found him, so I have to he had to ask a direct question. Are you the true one? If this could happen to the greatest man born from a woman, then no one is exempt. The Lord isn't bothered by us going to him with doubt. Lord, why did this happen to me? Jesus didn't say, how can my own cousin doubt? Out, I, I rebuke you. He said, no, go and tell John that the blind see, that the deaf hear, that the lame walk, that people are being healed, that he shouldn't wait for another one. He satisfied his doubt. John chapter 20 takes us before the most notable doubter in all of history, Thomas. Thomas was the classic stubborn person. He wasn't willing to accept any rumors without first asking some philosophical questions. In our days, he would be a lawyer or an attorney. And Jesus chose Thomas as one of his closest friends. Maybe he needed a disciple like this with a, with a difficult mind amongst his ranks. All organizations need people like this to think, not to just say, Yes, Pastor, yes, Pastor, yes, Pastor. Oh, there's a, there's a puddle? All right, let me jump in it. No, we have to think sometimes. We can't just surround ourselves with people that always say yes. And there's a reference to Thomas, that unforgettable day in that upper room. Jesus says, Jesus is preaching in the upper room, and he says, you know where I'm going, and you know what will happen. And out of that pluralistic ignorance where no one be, no one understands anything but no one wants to be the first one to ask, that's called pluralistic ignorance. It happened at school and it still happens today. The minister of economy speaks and says, hmm. But we didn't understand anything. But you never want to ask. And so Jesus said, you know where I'm going, you know. And everyone said, amen. Thomas. Maestro. Teacher. Maestro. Teacher. Sí. Yes. ¿Qué pasa, ¿Qué pasa, What's going on, Thomas? No idea dónde vas. We have no idea where you're going. How can we know where you're going? Y todos and everybody gave thanks because somebody o dared to ask. No so Thomas doesn't accept the subtleness of directness. Of Thomas is like many of you he loves what's pragmatic he doesn't take anything for granted Thomas went everywhere the 12 went you can have faith and see miracles yet still have questions and in John 20:25, 20, Thomas after, G after they said that Jesus resurrected he said look I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side I won't believe it Thomas answered with the credo of skepticals. He said, look, I'm going to believe it once I can actual, actually touch. I have to have my own evaluation if it doesn't bother you. And we're willing to condemn Thomas because he w wanted to invalidate the news. He never said this is impossible. He never discarded the miracles. He never said he's a scammer. He simply wanted to examine the evidence personally. Here's another scene. The same room eight days later. John 20, 26. Eight, di eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly Jesus was standing among them, and he said, Peace be with you. 
significativo que a pesar de su reserva it's significant se quedó entre ellos. that Thomas y remained amongst them we tend to condemn and throw out the one that doubts but who is the disciple that had the most genuine testimony who else put his fingers in the, in, the, in, the, in the wound on his side who else put his fingers in the wounds in his wrists who else carried with him for the rest of his life a memory of a, of a, of a tangible body only Thomas the, the one who doubted and Jesus said to Thomas put your fingers here and look at my hands put your hand into the wound in my side don't be faithless any longer believe and Jesus says in Luke 24 38 why are you frightened he asked why are your hearts filled with doubt look at my hands look at my feet you can see that it's really me touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do as he spoke he showed them his hands and his feet oh they all doubted but Thomas is the only one that said it they all saw, they all stood there in disbelief. Suppressed doubt is harmful. It's like that letter from the IRS that we don't want to open. We don't even know what's in there. We don't know if they're giving us money or if they're taking us into custody. But sometimes that emotional burden exceeds what that envelope might even contain. And that produces interest that will take your faith to bankruptcy. Honest questions deserve powerful declarations. And the Bible says that then Thomas said, Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh my God. I can't read this passage without feeling my heart shudder. Because one of the most crucial moments in all of Scripture are this one where when Thomas says, Oh my Lord, oh. It's always the most powerful testimony. The one that's the most hostile, the most aseptic. And this testimony that seemed hostile was answered with the, Oh God, oh my Lord. That's what happens when we touch him. When we say, Lord, teach me, show me. Why am I having to go through this season in the hospital? Show me why I had to go through this cemetery. Why, did, why didn't you heal him? Why did I go into bankruptcy? Don't fear asking questions. Because I assure you that after you get to know why, You'll say, oh, Lord, my God, it was you behind it all. You had control of it all. That's what happens with Thomas. And the more I mature, the more I realize my own ignorance, really. All I have to do is turn on Discovery Channel, read a science book, flip through the pages because I don't really understand anything. I listen to experts in technology, or I simply go into a library. I go into a library and I realize oh, all the books I haven't read. And so I tend to say, Lord, you know my limited capacity. You know the hard drive you gave me, it's limited. Help me understand that I'll never have all the answers. I don't have a long enough life to read all the books I want to read. But we can say, Lord, open up my mind. I doubt, but I want you to satisfy my doubts. There is no more critical territory than our minds. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. Proverbs 27.3. Do we believe it? And my main calling is, I think, is to help free people from their mental captivity. It's what I feel in every message. It produces more satisfaction than seeing the lame walk, leave their wheelchairs. Because you can recover your legs, but never your mind. But when you recover your mind, the word comes to me. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Freedom to the captives and an open mind listen all the youth an open mind lets you see opportunities that will remain closed for those that have a closed mind and a rough cognitive bias sometimes they ask how does God open doors no what I opened is doors or my mind and that's what opens doors I lost fear to what's secular to the worldly to the mundane an open mind opens the future only with an open mind can you believe God so that he can open doors for us that he doesn't open for others. And if we don't know our minds, we're going to be prisoners of our limited beliefs. And we're going to receive what we can receive like grandma. Oh, I don't understand the remote. 
All right, then don't ask for more. Give me the phone, but make sure it's working. Don't teach me. Don't ask grandma to, te to learn anything but because she's never going to be Bill Gates. But God also respects old wineskins. When he says you can't put new wine in old wineskins, he's not saying that the old wineskin is useless. He's saying, no, I'm going to respect that you're not ready for this conversation. There are things that your mind won't receive, whether it's because of beliefs or environment or cognitive bias. So you have to say, Lord, don't allow me to lose out on new wine because of my closed mind. There are things, there are ministries that I don't understand. I don't understand them. And though I don't understand them, I say, Lord, I never want to see myself as a stubborn person criticizing what I don't understand because surely that's reaching things that I can't reach. With tattoos and with that rock star hairstyle, they're reaching crowds that I can never reach. And I can reach crowds that no one else can. As soon as we get to know our minds, we're capable of opening it up and expanding it. So this morning, this afternoon, this night, wherever you're watching, I invite you to download a new operating system, a new app to reconfigure our minds. Are we ready for that? We're going to stop having human religious minds to have God's thoughts. Philippians 2.5 says your thoughts and actions should be like Christ's. So when you have faith, your structure reorganizes itself in, in, in harmony with the Holy Spirit. If not, our mind will shrink to the size of our logic, or what's worse, to the size of our lack of common sense. I know it's easier to find something incorrect in what's new than admitting that there's something wrong in our old way of doing things. And I know that there are, there are people that say, I prefer to be faithful to the old school way. Well, faithfulness isn't about doing things the old way. Faithfulness isn't defending your, your doctrine. It's the bravery to rethink. You don't always do things the same way. So I don't want to hear people that have already failed. Let's leave our sin in the baptismal pools. Let's leave our past lives there. But please, let us not lose our brain there. We're going to renew it every day. In Corinthians 2, 16 says, Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That is who we are. That's what we're made of. Mind, body, soul. And I repeat what God said to us during the pandemic. Pharaohs of religion, let my people think. Celebrate that God that gave us that mind. Celebrate that marvelous Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Give a grand applause to him because the captivity is being broken today. The jail cells open up. Whoa. The gates and the prisons open up. Somebody needs to believe it. Yes or no? Do you truly believe it? Come on, celebrate, celebrate. Can you hear the doors in the jail opening up? They open up. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands with me. Father, if you're here for the first time or at home, if you've never heard anyone speak about the Lord, I invite you to say, I invite you into my heart. Forgive my sins and write my name in the book of life. But if you're already a Christian, if you already have Christ in your heart, whether it's because you just said this prayer or because you already were, join me now. And you know that I won't ask you to repeat anything or to tell anything to the person next to you. But I'm going to ask you a huge favor. If only you could put your hand on your forehead as a sign of your mind, of your brain. Generally speaking, we place our hand on our heart, but we're going to put our hand on our, on our head and say, Lord, renew my way of thinking. Take from me all religion. Any vestige of tradition, human tradition, Uninstall the old way of doing things. First, we're going to uninstall all the infected archives. The antivirus of the Holy Spirit will go through your entire mind right now. Don't be surprised if you literally feel something in your mind because 
It's an antivirus that is uninstalling everything that is infected, your way of being, your cognitive bias, your filter. It stopped you from growing. It's impeded you from success, from healing. There it is. There it is. There it is. The Holy Spirit cleaning it out, removing moment by moment all viruses inherited from parents, grandparents, siblings, teachers, pastors, priests, rabbis that have misinstructed us and they've told us how to draw a home, how to create God, how God thinks, what pleases Him, what doesn't please Him. And they've taken from us the privilege of depending on the Holy Spirit in a direct way. More. More of the Spirit. Oh, more. More from the Holy Spirit now. The Holy Spirit cleaning out our minds. This is more than a morning of miracles. You don't know what happens when the mind cleans itself. And just like with the computer, we've discovered that there's a lot of available memory, that there were many gigabytes that were infected, and so your memory, your creativity were slow. All electronic devices, all cell phones run slow when there's too much information that needs to be set free. So now that we've uninstalled the old information, you've heard it be said. Store for when you don't have any, but I say, I am your provider. You've heard it be said, all men are the same. They're abusers. But I say to you, they're not all the same. They don't all look like that father or that ex-partner. I will be your father, your husband, your God. You've heard it be said. No one is a prophet in their land. However, I can make miracles through you, through your own life, in your own land. Because the words that were said, they're written, but God is still alive and he is the author of those words. There's no one that can tell him what to do. Receive, receive, receive now. Now, through that hand on your head, let the new revelation come in. Let all the new come in. Now we're going to install. We're going to download that application where a new way of thinking is going to be installed. I'm going to pray so that the new wine can come upon us now. There are no old wineskins, so they're not going to be broken. The Lord's going to give you new revelation, new compassion, new mercy, a new burden. Can you be believe it? Can you feel it? I want you to articulate it in words. I want you to say it. I want you to pray and cry out and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you because something has changed here and at home. Impressive. Double portion of the Spirit blow now. Imprint in our minds a new revelation. Blow from your spirit. Imprint something new, something gigantic. Father, thank you for this afternoon, for this morning, according to wherever they're watching us from. Here at the local time in California, Lord, we give you thanks. You love us so. That is why you speak to us. You discipline us. You exhort us. And each week you take us to a new level. Father, I ask that that mind never goes back to its original size. May it expand. We expand the gates of our mind. Expand your tent, says the Lord. And I believe and I proclaim that on this day, Everything is new. Everything is fresh. We leave here light. The viruses don't matter. They're behind us. All things are made new. All things are made new. All things. Even those that will leave with doubts, allow yourself that doubt. God will, will appreciate it. Speak with him in the car. Speak with him at home and say, Lord, I have doubts. Explain to me. What father doesn't explain to his child? 
child? What teacher that doesn't appreciate? Education doesn't explain to their students. Are you ready for the truth? Then God will give you the truth. And the truth will set us free. Father, I bless your children. I bless your, your army, your frontline workers. Bless them in their entry, their exit, when they go to bed and when they wake up. Bless us in what we create, what we strive for in our hours of entertainment when we relax in our hours of work I bless all those that travel those that cross borders those that come in and out bless the womb of these women bless the work of these men and women we bless our children our grandchildren our, our grandparents we bless our partners we bless Lord everything that surrounds us we proclaim your blessing and I proclaim us blessed healed free of all captivity in the mind in the soul and in the spirit glory to Jesus May God bless you. Bye. Until next Sunday. Let's be free, people. Bye, bye, bye. Blessing. Apareciste una noche de soledad. Abandonado y perdido te reconocí. Tu voz diciendo menos temas. Yo estoy aquí. El Padre me envió por ti. Me curaste las heridas, me sanaste en mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz Algo tan grande no lo puedo comprender Oigo tu dulce voz diciéndome una y otra vez Oh, 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 oh. eres bienvenido, eres amado una y otra vez Oh, 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 oh. bienvenido a mí Abandonado y perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciendo menos temas Yo estoy aquí, el Padre me envió por ti Y me curaste las heridas, me sanaste mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste llenar